Question two. Why does Oshalan reproduce the idea of the moneyed Jew? Why does Oshalan repeatedly assert that Jewish people have a special relationship with making money? Because Oshalan is not a scholar of Jewish history or of anti-Jewish racism, he produces erroneous narratives generated by chauvinist historians inventing, inventing racist notions of Jewish economic difference. The narrative about Jewish people having a central economic function in the development of European capitalism was popularised during the 19th century and found its most powerful form in 20th century anti-Jewish propaganda such as the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. This narrative is still quite prevalent today as Jewish people are regarded as having a special relationship to capitalism. The myth's rationale suggests that because the medieval church forbade Christians from engaging in the money lending required to develop European capitalism, Jewish people filled that role, benefiting mightily. Jewish people are seen as having no other choice outside of meeting Europe's money lending needs because they were excluded from medieval craft guilds, elite professions and property ownership required for agriculture, etc. Scholars often accept the Jewish moneylender narrative as fact, without questioning its historical validity and accuracy. Historians such as Julie Mell explain how 19th century propagandists concocted the myth to provide a rational and econom economistic cause of medieval anti-Jewish racism. As Mel explains, medieval anti-Semitism was actually caused by irrational theological shifts demonising Jews to justify their exclusion from European society. Medieval literature portrays Jews as a source of spiritual evil, engaging in ritual murder, drinking the blood of Christian children and desecrating the host, the ritual bread used in the Christian Eucharist service. As Mel also points out, historical records disprove the Jewish moneylending myth. Actual historical documents from medieval Europe make only occasional mentions of Jewish moneylenders. In contrast, there is a vast documentation of non-Jewish Europeans involved in moneylending within both Christian and secular domains, hailing from countries such as Italy, Spain, France, Germany, Holland and England. Because notions of Jewish moneylenders are hegemonic and taken for granted, Ocelan doesn't even have to reference the myth when invoking 19th century narratives of Jewish economic difference. He need only note the Jews' relationship to many broad features of finance that include trade, merchants, markets, banking, economy, commodities, finance capital, capitalism, global economy and monopolies. He writes, When I think about the tribe of the Hebrews, two characteristics and survival strategies always come to mind. The first is a special relationship to making money. Jews sought financial influence at certain times and at times attained worldwide supremacy. Many influential people in the field of financial capital, which dominates the global economy, have Hebrew roots and are, therefore, Jewish. Oshelan here brings together several essentialist ideas. <clears throat> Excuse me. Establishing Jews as universal and timeless, the tribe of the Hebrews, an ahistorical identification separated from the emergence of capitalism by nearly 2,000 years, he makes the unsubstantiated claim that they use ancient survival strategies to keep making money that in turn endow them with financial influence and worldwide supremacy. His assertion that many capitalists have Hebrew or Jewish roots is a racist claim, not a historical fact. Oshelan later explains that the Jews' special relationship to commodity, money and trade relations extends into a second move where their sovereignty over money meant having a role in the government of newly emerging states. 
For Osherland, therefore, Jews are not just good at finance, they are also generally strategic actors always ready to seize opportunities to amass political power. And this imagined pursuit of power and wealth by the Jews is itself a source of societal harm that actively impoverishes and disempowers non-Jews. He says, the Jews' wealth, the material and immaterial wealth, power and dominance of one side, is realised at the expense of the poverty and weakness of the others, as well as their transformation into a herd. Because of this destructive role of Jewish social power, Oshelan argue, argues, we cannot take lightly the leading role of Jewish capital monopolism in both commercial capitalism and industrial capitalism in the modern age or refrain from emphasising it, in Oshelan's words. When credible left historians or, econ or economists write about capitalism, they explore its central features such as labour exploitation, the imperative for capital accumulation or the destruction of the planet. Or they analyse powerful global economies such as the United States, Japan or Germany and supranational bodies that advance capital like the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank or the World Trade Organisation. They don't cite Jewish power as a driving force behind capitalism. Oshelan raises the stakes of identifying the strategic position of Jews in the capitalist world system, claiming that without doing so, our movements will fail. He says, In a world system that has been hegemonic for 400 years, the strategic position of Jews in commercial, industrial, financial, media and intellectual capital monopolies continues to increase in importance. Without acknowledging this, we cannot theoretically analyse either a global or a local problem or solve it in practice. The role of Judaism, both as a strategic, ideological and material force, is even more evident in the construction of modernity and of the nation-state. These claims above about Jews, now represented as the religion of Judaism, rest on no supportive or evidentiary historical events, places or dates. Oshelan's discussion about Jews and money invokes an ecumenical we. Does his we include Jewish leftists? How do such claims affect Oshelan's anti-capitalist readers who accept his narrative about Jews and money as fact without knowing better? How does it make them feel about the Jewish people in their movements and about Jewish people generally? <clears throat> 